Let's take another look at that magnificent launch, but this time on slow motion video tape. Sort of an instant replay. Now, here for the first time, we discovered a little problem uh, from where we sit, and that's that, uh, that great cloud of uh, dust and smoke that comes up uh, with the wind in the, the southeast as we were getting it uh, blocked off our view there for the climb past the uh, umbilical towers, the tower that carries all the life support system uh, into the spacecraft while it stands on the ground. This is a picture from that tower, which is uh, only about 60 feet away, uh, showing the, the, the rocket as it went by at the 320-foot level. And there the skirt of the Saturn 1C stage, and that, oh, not quite. I, I was mistaken. I thought we were at the, at the base of the spacecraft, uh, the rocket. We were not at that point. You still saw that USA go by and the uh, venting liquid oxygen. And this is seen from the base. This is one of the NASA cameras, which are right there and are protected against the blast and heat of the liftoff. Honestly, I can't be sure that I can tell you what you're seeing right there. I can't make it out myself. It looks like the base of the rocket at liftoff, at, at, at ignition, uh, which it very well could be. We could have that seen out of sequence. There are the water jets at the pad, I'm told. Uh, they deluge this pad with over a million gallons of water pour across there in a very few minutes. Great jets of water uh, to dampen, of course, uh, the extreme heat from the launch and to put out any small fires that may have started on this uh, great dome of reinforced concrete, which is the launch pad. And there's a beautiful picture on that pillar of flame of that kerosene fuel with the liquid oxygen as the uh, furnishing the oxidizer. Seven and a half million pounds of thrust. Gulping thousands upon thousands of gallons of, uh, of uh, fuel every second. So makes that first 11 seconds which the seven and a half million pound thrust first stage operates. And so, the astronauts of Apollo 10 are well on their way for man's second voyage to the moon. They are just reaching their orbital height and their first orbit of the Earth, and in another three hours they will be, well, a little bit less than that now, two hours they'll be firing up for the uh, launch into uh, escape from Earth and their trip to the moon, which they will reach on Wednesday. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 continues after this pause for station identification. This is CBS. CBS. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 continues. Here again is Walter Cronkite. Well, Stafford, Young, and Cernan are on their way. They're reaching moon orbit, taking off from Cape Kennedy here. They're somewhere about over here now, just about over the coast of Africa, 115 miles high and traveling at 17,400 miles an hour. They come around the Earth, make uh, two loops of the Earth, and then across from where I am over here, about over the Pacific, just uh, at the edge of the western edge of Australia, they will fire that third stage engine again. It's fired successfully the first time to get them into orbit. Now it's 225,000 pound thrust engine must fire again. And that will be at 3.22 this afternoon, Eastern Daylight Time, or just two hours and seven minutes or eight minutes from now. When that engine fires, it speeds them up 
by about 10,000 feet a second to a speed of 24,300 or 400 miles an hour, uh, which is enough to escape the pull of the gravity of the Earth, at least to get into a lunar orbit. When they get up to that speed of uh, some 24,000 miles an hour, they were then about 10,000 miles out here uh, at, uh, uh, after the lunar orbit begins the lunar trajectory begins, the command module separates, goes around and picks up the lunar module and gets rid of that third stage of the Saturn rocket as having done its job. And then they're on the way. They're on the way for a three-day, 238,000-mile trip, reaching the moon on Wednesday uh, of this week. They have to fire their 20,500 pound thrust service propulsion system engine for the first time and that uh, it is hoped will work. If it works well, it's got one more firing that is terribly important. They'll fire, fire it to come into a 59 mile orbit of the moon. They've got to slow down actually. If that engine did not work, they would come into a free trajectory. What happens is that out here at about 38,000 miles, they begin to pick up the moon's gravitational pull. They've been slowing down from that 24,000 miles an hour until they're down to around, oh, I think it's around four or 5,000 miles an hour at this point. But then the, the moon's gravity began to pick them up. And they then go faster and faster. But they come into the, the lunar gravitational pull and like a whip, it throws them around. If they didn't do anything, they'd be thrown right back onto that trajectory, called a free trajectory, going back to the Earth. Instead, they slow down. They slow down enough so they're not thrown out, but they're caught by the lunar gravity, and they circle the moon at 50, uh, 69 miles high. They do that for a day, taking a look at the moon, and while Cernan climbs down into that lunar module and checks out its systems, he goes back to sleep aboard the command module, and then on Thursday, he climbs back down with uh, Tom Stafford, the commander of this flight, on Thursday. They separate from the command module, and then by firing their engines and slowing down even more, they drop within 10 miles of the moon's surface right over that spot in the Sea of Tranquility, where it is expected that the crew of Apollo 11, if all goes well on this flight, will land in July. They make one more circuit, come down again at that 10-mile uh, altitude, making around uh, uh, 3,500 miles an hour, 3,900 miles an hour at that point, uh, passing just 11 miles over the moon, then back on out into this 69-mile uh, high orbit where they rejoin the command module. Stafford and Cernan climb back into the command module, another day of photographing the moon, and then on Saturday, back here, they fire that, uh, that 20,500 pound thrust service propulsion system engine, and it's got to work this time. There's no other way for them to come home. It's got to work. It's fired, and it speeds them up enough to escape the lunar gravity this time and start back coming back to Earth. Now, because they've got that momentum from circling the moon and their flight already of some 6,000 miles an hour, they're going to make this flight back here a little faster. Also, the Earth's gravity is a lot more powerful than the moon's gravity. They've got the Earth pulling them from almost the time they leave the moon, relatively speaking, so they're speeding up all the way back. They make it back in two days. It takes them three days to get out, two days to get back. They come directly into the Earth's atmosphere at uh, 25,000 miles an hour into that little corridor, seven degree wide wedge-shaped corridor they must come down to so they don't skip out or come in too sharply and they land out there 400 miles east of Pango Pango or 5,200 miles west of Walla Walla in the uh, Pacific Ocean. Out at Downey, California, Bill Stout and Leo Krupp uh, are uh, prepared to tell us just what happens now in getting into that translunar flight. Gentlemen? Well, that's certainly the next big decision in this flight, Walter, the next critical maneuver, whether to go for the moon, to leave the Earth orbit and head out into space. What will decide that, Leo, and what do they do? Well, Bill, during these parking orbits, the, the crew have been very busy checking out all the spacecraft systems to make sure they're functioning properly. At the same time, all the NASA engineers back at the Manned Spacecraft Center have been monitoring the system performance on telemetry to make sure everything is functioning properly. If all systems are go, about on the, uh, on the second orbit, when the spacecraft is over Australia, the S-4B will be reignited by a ground command. 
The S-4B will burn about five minutes and 22 seconds, which will accelerate the spacecraft from its present velocity. It will accelerate at another 7,000 miles an hour, which will give the spacecraft sufficient velocity to escape the Earth's gravitational field, allow it to coast toward the moon and be captured by the moon's gravitational field. So if everything checks out, they go for the moon near the end of the second orbit. If there were problems, they could go one more orbit and then make the jump out, couldn't they? Uh, that's right. Uh, ideally, we would do our translunar insertion on the second orbit. However, if there are problems or if something has to be ironed out, we do have the option of going another Earth parking orbit and doing our translunar insertion the next time around. And if they go, they'll head out into space, and a bit later, they'll break apart the command service module from the Saturn 4B, and we'll have our first look at the limb, won't we? Yes, that transposition and docking should be really spectacular at three hours into the mission on the color TV.